the romance of marcia by margaret sangster you see that little stone house with the roses climbing over it said my companion indicating with a gesture the place she meant we were driving together in the uplands of virginia and the time of the year was the sunny month of june i shall stop there and make a call on the lady who has lived there for the fifty years of her life it is the house where miss marcia was born after we have gone i will tell you her story i think it will interest you we drove through a long lane skirting a pasture where a jersey cow was grazing and presently we drew rein at the door a lady sitting in the porch rose and greeted my friend most cordially shaking hands with me very kindly too any friend of mrs meredith is more than welcome under this roof she said sophie meredith and i have been friends ourselves in sunshine and in shade since we were children we sat a while in the porch and then a little colored maid came to the door and said something in a low voice to her mistress the latter rose come in and taste my spice cakes and have a glass of milk she urged hospitably mountain air tends toward a good appetite and we needed no such bidding though the rooms were small they were furnished with a certain splendor and had an air unusual in the region where i was visiting Rich, dark rugs and colors dim and somber covered the floors. The heavy mahogany tables and chairs were polished until they shone like mirrors. And everywhere, in dining room, drawing room, passages and alcoves, there were books and pictures. My attention was drawn to the books, for though I had no time for more than a glance, I saw that the library in this house was an inheritance, that it had come to its present owner from book lovers who had finished their earthly course and left behind the things that were precious to them here when our call was ended and we were on the road again and beyond sight and hearing i said impulsively isn't she beautiful and her home is a dream do tell me about miss marcia does she live there alone alone except for old dilsey our cook and phoebe dilsey's daughter who is her little waiting maid yes she is beautiful and so is her house and now i'll let dan fare on at his own pace while i tell you about her judge peyton marcia's father had a young fellow studying law with him some thirty years ago when marcia was a radiant creature of twenty mrs peyton died in marcia's childhood and marcia was mistress of the house she was greatly admired all the young men in the countryside were her devoted followers as our courtly southern fashion dictates and marcia might have had her pick but she was fancy free and though our girls marry young and did marry at even younger age then than now Marcia managed to keep her train as friends, but held them off as lovers. Until John Lansing, the law student, came, I mean. But John was the one who had the key to her heart, and the two were presently engaged. The wedding day was set. Marcia's trousseau was ready. She has a trunk up in the garret, where she could show you, yellowed now, the soft white mull, trimmed with point lace, which was to have been her wedding gown. It lies there, soft and dainty, with the gloves and satin slippers, all meant for the slim girl whose sylph-like figure they fitted well 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 my friend stopped to take breath i thought of miss marcia ample stately with the beauty of her meridian and of the youthful lissome grace of the girl she once was and i too said well well but i added pray go on something happened what was it did john die die no said mrs meredith judge peyton had a stroke of paralysis just a light stroke but it changed his life and Marcia's. It muddled up his mind. He forgot things and grew cross and irritable. Then came another stroke and he was laid aside helpless. He had a successive stroke and lived in utter helplessness for 10 years. Marcia refused to leave her father. John Lansing's career waited for him in a northern state. He was not willing. Indeed, he said that family reasons forbade his settling in Virginia. I always blamed him. For does not scripture say that a man must leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife? But John was resolute. He offered to have the judge taken north, to have caretakers for him, to do whatever money could do, but he wanted Marcia to marry him as had been planned. Marcia was like a rock herself. She would never leave her father while he lived, nor disturb him, nor carry him away from his native place. In the end, John gave up pleading. Five years later than the day that would have been Marcia's bridal day, they broke the engagement. The judge died ten years later. I mean, ten years later than the wedding day that never was, and five years after the broken betrothal. The very week of his funeral, word came that John Lansing had married in Boston. So, that is all there is to tell. Marcia has never seen anyone she could love, and she is too strong and steadfast a woman to mope. 
She is the good angel of our region, and she lives in that grey stone house all alone. I don't see that Mr. Lansing was so much in fault, I said. Marcia seems to have been unreasonable. Her father did not need her after his mind had failed. At least, not if he could have been well cared for. One never knows, said Mrs. Meredith. There are gleams of consciousness, flashes in the mental gloom, and Marcia felt that her duty kept her by her father. She could not go against her conscience. Time passed, and one day, a year after this southern visit, I found myself in a New England town. At a church gathering one evening, where people from several boroughs and villages were present, I met a very beautiful young woman, the wife of the pastor. She was so sweet and wholesome, so bright and attractive, that my heart went out to her, and I thought her not only wonderfully charming, but ideally fitted to occupy the place of minister's wife, which not every woman adorns. And, taking it for all in all, a gracious and winsome wife is a gift from the Lord to a minister, and has a good deal to do with helping him to successful work in his parish. We had been chatting pleasantly for some minutes, when a tall, distinguished-looking gentleman with iron-gray hair, crowning a fine, well-set head, approached us. "'I am commissioned to escort you home, Ethel,' he said. "'Your husband has another meeting after these good friends go, and fears you will be tired.' "'Let me present my father, Mr. Lansing,' said the lady." It transpired before long that this was Marcia's John Lansing and no other, for Mrs. Dean went on to say, Father, Mrs. M. has spent a good many months in Blue Haven, where you studied when you were a boy. She may know some of your old friends. The little lady flitted off to find her husband and speak with him, and to put on her wraps. In that interval, Mr. Lansing addressed me directly. Pardon a strange question from a stranger, but did you by any chance, when in Blue Haven, Hear anything of the last of the Paytons, Miss Marcia, who married Eugene Brearley some years ago? I met Miss Payton, I answered, but she is Miss Payton still. She has never married. I met the Brearleys, too. Mrs. Brearley is a Richmond woman, and was very like a Payton. I do not know. I had a heavenly youth in Blue Haven, said Mr. Lansing as his daughter returned, apologetic and flushed because she had been detained. And Miss Marcia Payton was once a very dear friend. Later I learned that Mrs. Dean was an only child, and that Mr. Lansing had long been a widower, and that he had attained eminence in his profession and accumulated wealth, but I saw no more of him during my brief stay in that neighborhood. The end, or the second sweet beginning, of Miss Marsh's romance was told me some months afterward in a letter from Mrs. Meredith. Well, dearest, it ran, I am at this moment home from a wedding. Whose, do you ask? Of all women in the world, Marcia Payton's. She was married to her old lover, John Lansing, at noon today. The bride was dressed in dove-colored satin and looked so happy and peaceful, as if no storm had ever touched her, or ever could. As for John, he bore himself like a king of men. It appears that he was not so much to blame as I used to think. Before the breaking of that old engagement, he wrote Marcia a letter, offering to live in Blue Haven, help her care for her father, or do anything else she asked if she would but marry him. That letter, with the fiendish perversity of inanimate things, lost itself in a corner of the judge's library, and was slipped back between a bookcase and the wall. Marcia never received it, through someone's carelessness at first, no doubt. Consequently, she ignored it, and this hurt John, and led to the friction, which in turn led to the rupture of their ties. John married a sweet girl who adored him, and with whom he was happy. Some years ago, his wife died but he had an impression that Marcia was married, so he never sought to see her again. He lived by himself after the marriage of his only child, and quite recently he discovered that Marcia Payton was yet free, and after thirty years of absence he came to pay her a visit. As Providence mercifully ordained it, the very day John knocked at Marcia's door, a bit of the library ceiling had fallen, loosening the particular bookcase which had all along concealed John's old letter. Marcia had read it, kissed it, and cried over it, when, as if stepping out of a fairy tale, in walked the hero of the story, as large as life. I don't know, I'm sure, what arguments he used to persuade her, but he took rooms at the inn and settled fairly down to courting his old sweetheart. She was not easily won, for she said their ways had been apart and their habits had become fixed, and that she, at least, was too old to be any man's wife. She, indeed, superb as she is. Any man of the proper age might be proud to win her. And John Lansing is proud, for he pressed his suit eagerly, and Marcia Payton said yes at last. His daughter and her husband were at the wedding and seemed well pleased. Mrs. Dean told me she had been anxious in her own home, lest her father should be too lonely in his great house all by himself. They sail tomorrow, the Lansings, I mean, 
for Europe to be gone six months. Then they will spend some part of each year here in Marcia's old home. Has it not all ended satisfactorily? And though they miss their life's June together, they will have their Indian summer. End of The Romance of Marcia by Margaret Sangster.